So welcome everyone again to another Tennessee Soccer Club GK webinar in the webinar series. Tonight we are having another one of our fireside chats. Tonight we have with us John Bush, who is now coaching his within his own company, John Bush Goalkeeping, and he is a former 20-year professional goalkeeper, and he has graciously joined us, and he has known Coach E.V. for quite a while now, and Coach E.V., I will turn it over to you. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, we're obviously thrilled to have John Bush uh, spend some time with us tonight. Uh, so most of you who were at the uh, goalkeeper clinic we did last year will remember John. He was there for a night because he was on his way down to work with the U14 national team, I believe. And he was kind enough last year to stop by and and give us a night and uh, of training and a little bit of a uh, sort of a town meeting thing. And then uh, we were lucky to um, have him join us again tonight. And, uh, but before we get going, uh, we do need to send a special thanks again to Coach Lou and to Coach Jeff, who do all the technological stuff to get these things going for us. And we greatly appreciate it. Uh, as, as you know, uh, if it was up to me, we'd be using tin cans and wax string. So uh, thanks for you guys for doing that. Um, but anyway, John Bush uh, really needs no introduction. Uh, John and I have known each other, I guess Lou and I figured it out the other day, about 26 years, Bushy. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to, to know you. I'm proud to call you what, one of my third sons. And um, uh, hopefully that uh, we can cover some things tonight that these young goalkeepers will enjoy and, and uh, uh, take lessons from. Um, yeah. So we'll get it going. Uh, tell us about, you know, young John Bush up in uh, upstate New York and how you started into the sport and, and what you did, uh, you know, in your most formative years. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Lou and E, thanks for having me. Um, really excited to, to join you guys and, uh, you know, to chat with all your goalkeepers since I met a lot of them last year. So, um, yeah, young John Bush. So he kind of moved up and down the East Coast uh, in his early days because his dad was a Lutheran pastor. And we had a lot of different churches. But uh, I had an older brother who uh, was a forward and needed somebody to shoot on in, uh, in a, one of our stops in Virginia. And so we built a goal in the backyard, and he threw his younger brother, me, in there. And uh, – just start whacking balls at me. And for some reason, I actually liked it. So uh, that was kind of my, when it first I said, you know what, this is pretty fun. And then, uh, so we eventually moved back upstate to, to Albany, uh, up by Canada. And uh, that's really kind of when it all started kind of happening for me. Um, I was fortunate I was playing for a good youth club, uh, not like it is today with DAs and all that. You know, youth club was just a youth club, you know, your local town kind of area. Uh, played played for a club called uh, I think it was Capital United. I don't even know if it exists anymore up in Albany. Um, and then at the same time, I went to ODP. I uh, did ODP. Did uh, from ODP, you were invited into regional camps. Uh, we were in Region One, which is basically like the East Coast. And from regional camps, you were uh, scouted for the national teams. And I was very fortunate starting I think the age of 14, 15, uh, started working with the under 17 national team. And uh, back then you, you only had an under 17, an under 20, an under 23 and a full team. You didn't have all the other age groups like they do now. Uh, so fortunately for me, those early years, you know, 15 through basically 17, I spent two years with the under 17 national team which culminated in going to Japan in a World Cup. Uh, I think that was 90, 93, I think was the World Championships in Japan. Uh, from there, I uh, went to the under-20 national team. Uh, I think I was the only player to make the jump from still being a high school player and jumping in from the 17s to the 20s. Unfortunately, we didn't qualify, so that ended really quickly. Uh, <clears throat> about the same time I went from finishing high school in, in upstate New York to going to college at UNC Charlotte. Uh, 
and uh, that's where I met EV. The uh, kind of funny story about Charlotte, um, I actually, other than being in North Carolina, Lou, I didn't know much about it. And at that time when the head coach, Frank Holmstein, uh, called, I was actually supposed to go to UVA with Bruce Arena. And long story short, the, back then you really didn't have the, well, you didn't have the internet. So they had just replaced their goalkeeper coach and I didn't know anything about him. And so I asked Bruce just for another week or so uh, before my commitment so I could find out about him a little bit. And back then, again, without any internet, it wasn't like you could just Google somebody. So I actually had to, you know, try to make some calls and figure out who knew who and that sort of thing. So, you know, Bruce decided to, you know, give me a little grief back and told me he was going to take some money away every time. Uh, every day I, I procrastinated. Well, me being a young kid from New York, I didn't care for that. So around about the same time, Frank Holmstein calls, uh, and it's the middle of the winter. I think it's, you know, December, January uh, in upstate New York. And Frank says, you know, hey, we, we've been watching you. You know, would you like to come for a visit? And I said, uh, you know, where are you? He's like, Charlotte, North Carolina. And my next question was, what's the temperature? And he said, oh, it's beautiful today. I don't know, it was whatever, 60s or low 70s. And I said, you know, I looked, out my, I looked out my window and there were four feet of snow. I said, yeah, I'll come down and visit. Absolutely, put me on a plane. So I <laughs> uh, went down, visited, actually fell in love with it. Um, you know, again, didn't know much about it, but fell in love with the fact of the players were all down to earth. It wasn't like they were trying to impress me with, with the, uh, with the school or anything like that. You know, they, their big emphasis was you can help us build something. And that was really cool to me. Um, and then obviously learning about EV and, and that sort of thing, uh, didn't know much about them, um, at that time, but obviously I'm very thankful. I kind of stepped in it on that one. Um, but I remember the other nice part about it was there were, I think six or eight New Yorkers on the team. And so I felt very comfortable around them and, and, uh, you know, felt just at ease, uh, on the last day, so much so on the last day that before I flew back on the Sunday night, we actually played roller hockey in the, in one of the front tennis courts and anybody who's from, you know, the East coast and up North, you play hockey, right? EB played hockey. I play hockey. And so for me playing roller hockey with them Sunday morning, just kind of solidified in my mind was like, this is the place for me to be. Uh, went home and parents picked me up and they said, how'd it go? I said, I want to go to school in New North Carolina, Charlotte. And Frank called me the next day and, you know, basically asked what it took. And I told him, and that was the end of it. That's how quickly it happened. Uh, but it was probably outside of me marrying my wife. It was probably the best decision I ever made. Um, you know, because it, it, without, again, without me knowing it, it really set me up, um, for, having a long professional career and, and being under EB's tutelage. Um, again, I didn't know it at the time, but as we progressed, uh, I think it started probably after my freshman year um, in the, you know, in the winter when we were training, we would have all these professionals coming in to train and get ready for their seasons. Uh, you know, Mike McGinty's, Jeff Dubak's, Aiden Heaney's, I mean, guys that, you know, the young kids won't know who they are, but us older guys, I mean, these were, these were top pros that were all coming in or driving into Charlotte to train with EV. And we were very fortunate as the college kids to be able to be around these guys. And, um, you know, so my, my education into what it took to be a pro, even though I had had that idea in my mind, since the early days with the youth national teams, when we would go over to Europe and see these guys and be around their training facilities. And Peter Meller, one of my old goalie coaches, would put those ideas in my head. But this was really the first time I was, you know, able to kind of rub elbows with pros and see, you know, and see what it took and see how they train and see their mentality and, and, and everything that went into it. Um, so for me, it was, it was a soccer education, you know, learning on the fly and being around them. Um, and, uh, you know, we, EB and I, we, I mean, like I said, we, you know, he, he's my second dad and I've, I've said that for many, many years and, and, and I absolutely love the man. Um, and we've become so much more than just obviously player coach, but back then, 
um, you know, we, it, we, were, we were getting to know each other that first year. We were definitely getting to know each other. We had some goods and we had some interesting times. You know, I was a typical young kid who thought I knew everything about everything. Um, I learned very quickly that I didn't know much about anything. So, uh, and EB, EB made sure I understood that. Um, we we had some good, fun times, but uh, again, he, you know, so probably after that first year, I think it was, um, I remember going to EB at one point and, and I don't know if it was a spring or maybe it's spring of my freshman year or, or going into the sophomore year. I, I said to him, I said, you know, E, I, I want to be a pro. I don't know if I'm ever going to be good enough or, you know, if, if it'll work out. I was like, but. I know you know how to get us get me there and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And and that's kind of how it started, you know. And and again, I didn't I had no clue. You know, he had the blueprint and I understood that by then I think we were really starting to build our relationship and I knew that I had to do what he told me to do to have any chance of it. Um you know, and, 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 and I learned that, that that first offseason, seeing all these older senior pros coming in to work with him. I knew that there was something special there. Um, and so well, – so, let, Hold on. Let's rewind yeah. a little bit because, yeah. um, you know, you as you said, you moved around a lot. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, you know, back then, even with – even as young as you are, there weren't a whole lot of goalkeeper coaches around. You know, no. um, goalkeepers – even back when you were growing up, I mean, you, you had the occasional camp you could go to and you had mm-hmm. the occasional uh, maybe local guy who had, at some point had played. But share with the kids, you know, how you prepared yourself, uh, you know, separate from your team training. Because I know you you did not, you know, you didn't just show up Tuesday and Thursday and train with your team and play on weekends. Yeah. You, you did other stuff that, that improved, that got you ready for ODP yeah. and the national team. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I thought forgot about that. Um, so, yeah, there weren't really any goalie coaches around that time. Few and far between, not like today. So, uh, in the summers, I did go to number one goalkeeper's camp, Joe Matchnick's camp, once a week, or, or sorry, once a summer. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, we lived in Pennsylvania after Virginia for three years. So I w- the church that my dad worked at, he had a, they had a gym in, in, in it. So I would come home from middle school and I would literally just go in, into the gym and just kick the ball off the wall for hours and just work on my technique. And um, it was a wood floor. So I realized, you know, I had to kind of pad up. So I bought like football pads and stuck them in my shorts you know, and, and then I would wear pants and and elbow pads and everything. I just basically padded myself up and learned how to dive technically on the, you know, on the wood floors and throw it against the wall and just really trained myself for hours on end. Um, And then, you know, I do that. And, and occasionally we would, uh, we would, I played about 30, 45 minutes away. Um, And occasionally when I would go down there, one of the older uh, high school goalies at the time, a gentleman named Aleko, uh, was a very good goalkeeper. He would come over occasionally and train some of the younger goalies. Uh, I don't know if they paid him or whatever, but, you know, he basically kind of was our first, a few of us, our first kind of goalie coach, if you want to call it. And, and it wasn't every Tuesday or Thursday. It was just more kind of when Aleko had time and when he would show up. Uh, but the most of it was left to us to try to figure out. Um, uh, you know, again, when, and then when I moved back up to Albany, uh, kind of the same thing. Um, you know, by then at least I was with the national team program. Uh, and with them, I did have a goalie coach, Peter Meller, who was an old English goalkeeper. Uh, so I would take stuff that Peter worked with us on or the drills he did with us when we go away every couple of months. And I would do those with the other high school, uh, goalies that I could find or, uh, I would just have some of the minor league pros that were in town, the Albany, I think they were called Albany Alley Cats at the time. Uh, they would, I would ring them up and just ask them if they would come and shoot on me. Um, and if I didn't have that, then I would, uh, at the high school, we they had one of those big kickback boards. And if I couldn't find somebody to shoot on me or, or I couldn't find somebody to stay after school, uh, then I would just go out there 
and uh, I couldn't drive yet, but I knew what time the last bus left. And I think we got out of school about 3.20, 3.25, and the last bus home was 5.45. So I usually was finishing up about 5.40 and running to the front of the school so I could uh, get on the bus and not, uh, not have to call the old reverend to come pick <laughs> me up because he yeah. probably wasn't going to be too happy. Um, yeah. But it was more me learning. You know, it was more me figuring it out, um, you know, and taking what bits and pieces from either Peter Miller or number one goalkeepers camp or things like that. I mean, again, we didn't have Google, we didn't have YouTube, um, you know, and just kind of put my stamp on what was going to work for me. Um, and, and, you know, kind of like your story you, with me going down to Mexico and, and watching them, you know, you, yeah. you learn by watching back then. And, yeah. and that's, that was the same for me um, until I think my junior or senior year in high school, when I could finally drive, there was one goalie coach and he lived a couple towns over about 40 minute drive. And his name was Bernie Watt. And I used to go, he was a school teacher as well. Um, I think he, he played some, you know, minor league pro or something back in the day. Uh, I used to go over to him once a week. Um, and I think it was like, 25 bucks or something like yeah. that. And I mm -hmm. had to beg my mom for 25 bucks every week, but I'd go to him, you know, every week and we train, I don't know if it was Saturday, Sunday, whenever it was. And that, that was the extent of my goalkeeper training. So, okay. So fast forward to, you've played in high school, you played club, you're, you're, you've done ODP. Now you're on the U17 national team playing in Japan. Tell the kids about that. Um, yeah, it was, well, you know, we'll start with, the, our qualifying. Our qualifying was in Cuba. And back then, obviously, Americans were not liked in Cuba. So that was our first, uh, as young kids, again, qualifying you, we were probably 15 when it started, something like that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, 15, 16. And, uh, you know, we get off the plane and there's literally armed guards with, you know, with M16s in their hands and we're you know we're kids and we're going holy moly we just landed in a world that's you know we don't understand we weren't allowed out of our hotel unless we were going to practice or to a game we had armed security everywhere we went uh it was you know it was pretty interesting for a young kid um I learned my first real lesson um as a player during that tournament it was we had, I think it was the second game, and it was late in the game. We were winning, and if we won, we already made it through to the next round. And I came out just to scoop a simple ball, and I don't know, remember who we were playing, but the forward decided to, as the ball's bouncing, to decide to volley me in the chest. And uh, so he volleyed me and didn't, you know, not too hard, but I ended up pushing him away. I got a red card for it. Uh, he got a yellow, I got a red card. And so, you know, I was obviously upset. I went to the locker room. We won, no problem. Uh, so the, the last game of that third round, or the, probably the first round, didn't matter. We were already through. Well, you know, I didn't think I was going to really get in too much trouble because everybody obviously at the game saw me, you know, get volleyed in the chest. And the, the coach, Roy um, – oh, gosh, what was his name? Roy – can't remember his name now. But uh, old Welsh gentleman – came in and literally ripped me up one side down the other and came back for seconds. And, uh, I mean, threatened me with everything of never going on another national team camp, never regaining my number one position. I mean, had me in tears, absolutely had me in tears. Um, I went to my room. I sat there, and a few minutes later, Peter Miller, uh, Peter Miller knocked on the door and came in. Uh, sat with me for probably 30, 40 minutes and explained, broke it down, explained to me what Roy, why Roy was so upset and, and possibly losing his goalkeeper, you know, starting goalkeeper and yada, yada, yada. So for me, that was my first real uh, learning, pro uh, learning experience as, as a young kid to say, wow, you know what? I, I, I almost cost the team in this situation. Um, and so Fortunate for me, we won the next game with our reserve goalkeeper. Roy put me back in uh, quarterfinals, won the quarterfinals. Uh, we go to the finals, and it's against Cuba. We have to beat them by two goals to win the goal, the uh, win the cup, and we ended up scoring a second goal with like 10 minutes left and then just hung on for dear life. Uh, 
Uh, and so we, we won CONCACAF that year, uh, went, you know, qualified to go to Japan and, you know, I don't know how many months later or whatever we, we were, you know, we're in Japan as young kids, um, all now 16, 17 year olds, uh, playing in a, in a world championship. And I think we made it to the quarterfinals, if I remember correctly. And then unfortunately lost to Poland. I think it was two, one, three, one. Uh, and they were some massive, massive people. They were big boys compared to what we were, but, uh, unbelievable experience. Um, again, my real first taste of international soccer and, and everything that you see when you travel abroad. Um, you know, again, back then being in the States, again, no internet, no, you know, probably barely any games on TV. We didn't understand, uh, the environment necessarily sometimes over there. Uh, but Roy did everything he could for that two year process to put us in those environments as often as we could. I mean, we were constantly over in Europe, any, any chance he could take us there. It didn't matter what country, just getting in the environment um, and, and learning what it was about. Uh, so that was, that, that was pretty cool for two, you know, two plus years. So you, so you, you go, you play, you play on the national team. You come to UNC Charlotte. Um, you have a, a fine college career, your junior year. Um, uh, you make all American, uh, the team has, goes on a run. We get to the final four, um, Tyrone Marshall hits a bike on you game over. Move on to your next phase <laughs> yeah, of your life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, but I can remember, I can remember you say, telling me, um, and we won't get into the catchable ball story because, you know, <laughs> They don't there's, want to hear. There's it. there's, chil there's children around. <laughs> <Believe that one>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so, but during the course of your college career, you know, you are known for your proficiency with playing with your feet. Uh, but in college, you weren't. You know, yeah, you were you were decent with them, but it wasn't something that you were you could hang your hat on like you could like you could when you were a pro. Yes. Uh, yes. And um, and then the other thing was, you know, you're five ten. And uh, so you you had to work on areas of your game, such as, you know, learning how to play with both feet, you know, mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, you had to, you had to do physical training that enabled you to jump so that mm -hmm. you could catch crosses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and uh, but, you know, I've told the kids this before and you can embellish on it if you like. But, you know, I, I remember the days when you would take a stack of balls up to the practice uh, pitch and just hit ball after ball. Like, like Stefan was talking about in his interview, ball after ball, jog down, hit ball after ball back. And I yeah. remember you said, you remember, I think if I'm not mistaken, you know, your, your goal was you'd make yourself hit a hundred balls every day. Yeah. You know, 50 with your right foot, 50 with your left foot. Yeah. You know, and go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, you're, you know, it, it, it kind of goes back to you know I, I knew very early a I was not going to be tall you know so for me to have part of my game was going to have to be you know uh, my spring and my jumping and, and my explosiveness um, you know again I was fortunate that at match next camp they taught us plyometrics right and the jumping and everything so I used to go home in Albany and in our basement, we, you know, we had a cement floor, but we put some carpet over it. We had one of those little exercise all in one things that we bought from Sears or somewhere like that. Um, and I used to set paint cans up in, in the other half of the garage or other half of the basement. And I just used to do plyometrics and footwork through them, you know, and I would do that three or four nights a week after dinner for 20, 30 minutes. Um, so my work ethic started all the way back then. Cause I knew that I didn't want this to be the, you know, the, the reason or the excuse of, well, he's too short, you know, I wanted to make up for it. Um, so when you talk about me being able to, to play with both feet, um, uh, when I went to, you know, obviously when I got to Charlotte and you'll remember these days, like I only was left footed and I think it was a week or two into preseason and we're playing a game, a scrimmage at home. and one of the defenders plays a ball to my right foot. Well, I tried to play, I tried to kick it down the field with the outside of my left, Lou. That didn't go so well. I think it went to the other forward. Fortunately, he did not score. 
So, you know, we're walking off afterwards. And, you know, again, I, in my mind, I'm like, you know, all right, I got to do something, whatever. Frank pretty much made it up for me, made my decision up. He dropped two bags of balls in front of me as we're walking to the locker room. And he's like, where are you going? I'm like, game's done like we're going to shower you know like everybody else is going he's like oh no no no. he's like drops the two bags of balls and I kind of look at them and look at him and he's like I want 150 balls every day with your right foot he's like I don't care what day of the week it is I don't care what we have the only days you don't have to do is game day and it just as EV said literally I would just start on one end and kick every ball as far as I could and you know the first probably couple months you know, you're lucky if I could kick it 10 or 15 yards, you know, but I would do this every day. I kick them down, I kick them back and I kick them down. I kick, you know, and, and I did it 150 balls every day. And it, there's no, it's not sexy, right? Everybody wants to do the sexy drills and look good. And it's not sexy. It's not fun necessarily, but I knew that this is what I needed to do, you know? And I, and I, by then I had bought into Frank, I bought into EV. I, I knew that they were doing what was best for me. Um, you know, and this, this went on for the three years I was there. I did this every day, yeah. you know, and until, you know, and, and I would still do it to the day I retired of, you know, maybe not 150 balls, but I made sure I balanced it off, you know, because I'm left footed dominant. So I need to be able to be able to play with my right. And I tease the kids that I, I coach now, um, but, you know, when I'm feeling good about both feet after serving, I, I always tease them and say, probably about the only goal, goalkeeper coach that hits balls with both feet at you, don't they? You know, I get a little smile yeah. out of them, yeah. but yeah. you know, that's, True. It, it, it's True. good for them to see both feet, but it's also, you know, it, it would not have happened if, if, you know, Frank wouldn't have dropped those two bags of balls. Yeah. And, and it's about, it, it's not about being scared of your deficiencies. It's, it's about realizing them and figuring out a solution on how to overcome them. You know. Uh, okay, so we so we fast forward now. We go to uh, we lose to FIU, so your yep. that's your junior season's over. Um, and um, I I remember back then they gave television breaks at the twenty two minute mark. Oh yeah, uh, the last yeah. the last twenty two minutes of the second half. You know, you came over and and you know. Uh, like okay, well, what do I do? I think we we're down four to one. It was like after after Tyrone scored the goal, it was like sit back, have a coffee. We're we're going yeah, over. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and I remember saying, okay, you know, enjoy your last twenty two minutes of college because yep. you're ready. To, you're ready to go be a pro. You know. Yeah. Yep. And um, you know, so tell us the tell us the professional journey because, and I'll, I'll I'll repeat this for the for the audience, but you know, you played professionally for twenty one years. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, in, I mean, anywhere you work 21 years is a, is a big thing, but to be a professional athlete for 21 years is, is something that only a handful of people in, in any, if you combined all sports total can say, uh, yeah. but like everything, you know, it starts somewhere to, to tell us, share that journey yeah. with us. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to back it up just a little bit. So just so everybody understands. So after my sophomore year, you know, uh, and again, I was on, I was on EV's time, right? I didn't know when, when, I, if I was going to be ready and when that would, time would be. So, you know, and we didn't talk about, it. that was the cool thing. We never really talked about it much. You know, I think maybe I would ask at the end of the season uh, after sophomore year and EV was like, no, you need another year. Okay. No problem. You know, and it was never brought up again. It was like, all right, back to work. And so the story he's talking about there in the junior year, um, again, it was, we never talked about it during the season. It was, you know, we were focused on the season. Um, that was a conversation that we had in the off seasons or springtime or whatever. Well, again, we're, we're getting our behinds kicked pretty good by FIU. And just like EB said, I, I, we walk over for the TV timeout or, you know, whatever it was called uh, in the 20, 22 minutes left. And I just looked at EB and I'm like, what do I do? And again, it, you know, right. You know, one of his great quotes is like, just enjoy your last 22 minutes of college soccer. And I just kind of looked at him and then I looked at the team to see if anybody heard him and nobody heard. And I looked back and, he's, and he just looked at me, he goes, you're ready to leave. And for me, it was a really cool moment, even though we were getting killed. Um, it was a really cool moment because 
you know, in essence, he gave me his, he gave me the blessing and, you know, not maybe necessarily the way I wanted to end my college career losing, but at the same time, the validation that he gave me in that moment, uh, as I remember walking back to the goal, kind of like pinching myself going, holy crap, like, here we go, you know? Um, and then after the game, you know, EB, Marsha, and my mom had actually driven down from Albany. Uh, we went out to dinner and we, I remember telling my mom and uh, she was great. She was, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, we went back the next morning on the bus, um, walked in the locker room, asked the boys not to leave the locker room. Uh, and I went in and talked to coach Tart and uh, his assistant Ray and told them, and apparently they, they knew it was coming, even though nobody had said anything, they knew it was coming. Uh, went in and told the boys and uh that was it. You know, it was just, it was time for me to move on and everybody was, you know, very supportive about it. Um, you know, now part two of the blueprint, we'll call it, it was where to go and, and the next step, uh, you know, because everybody thinks you just go from college to the MLS, you know, and, and life is fantastic and you're, you know, you're the next David Beckham kind of thing. Um, and that's far from it. You know, again, I leaned on EB very heavily uh, because he knew the path uh, and it was, it was going into the minor leagues and it was riding the buses for hours on end. It was playing, sometimes playing Friday, then turn around playing Saturday nights or playing Friday, then Saturday travel, Sunday play, you know? Uh, but the purpose was to get games in as a young professional. Again, I didn't see the whole picture. EB knew the whole picture. And, and again, I'm very thankful I listened to him about it. Uh, so I signed my first pro contract with the Carolina Dynamo at the time. And uh, they, had, they had two very good pros. So I was a third guy. Uh, so they had Aiden Heaney, who just came back from the New England Revolution. And they had Scott Garlick, who was just starting to make his time up and back with DC United. And uh, so I was the young kid. Uh, so about halfway through the season, they did, I, I think I had two games under my belt. Um, and back then in the old USL, you could loan a player between teams. So halfway through the Worcester wildfire of Worcester, Massachusetts wanted this youngster. And again, I was just like, sure, if they want me to play, I'll play. Um, so Carolina still owned me, but they loaned me for the second half of the season. So I played, I think, 18, 19 games that first year um, when I got up there. Not a great place to be. Not a good place to live. But it was great for me because I played. Team was terrible. We had no money. We had no budget. Um, but I got, I got my first taste of, you know, of playing games and the experience I needed. Um, after that year, came back to Carolina, trained with EB. And um, the following season, Worcester wanted me back. They had a new coach, but I didn't want to go back there. So I ended up signing in Virginia Beach. Uh, so I spent three years in Virginia Beach, played there. I uh, really enjoyed it uh, until I tore my knee for the first time. Uh, I had my, yeah, my third year there, I had tore my PCL, had to have surgery on it. Um, that was my first major kind of setback. Uh, you know, shortly after that, and the, se the season ended, the team folded. So now I'll, not only am I rehabbing um, and I'm trying to get back to health, but I've now lost the team that I had a contract with because they went under. Uh, so I played my next year in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And the bonus was it was owned by the Hershey Co Chocolate Factory. So that was good. We had three pa passes to the park. Um, but that was, uh, that, I played for a fantastic coach, Bob Lilly, who now coaches the Pittsburgh River Hounds. Uh, we had a fantastic team, made it all the way to the finals, won the, right, won the Eastern Conference regular season, then made it all the way to the finals, lost to Rochester 2-1, to uh, was goalkeeper of the year that year in the USL. Um, and during that season, uh, Greg Andrulis came, he was the coach of the Columbus crew at the time, had come over about three or four times, I didn't realize this, and actually watched me play in Hershey. Uh, and so after one of the playoff games, he was in Hershey watching us, and he pulled me aside and, and asked me, he said, look, Mark Doherty's retiring at the end of the MLS season. Would you be interested? We have a backup position available. 
uh, of course, I said yes. They drafted me that winter in one of the drafts, and I ended up going to Columbus. But that was five years in the making, and I think close to maybe a, somewhere between 100 and 150 games in the USL before uh, I was ready to go. And again, that was part of the blueprint that EB knew, um, and he was the one that said, look, because there was a little bit of interest in the MLS uh, from D.C., um, I, I can honestly say now that if I would have went to the MLS straight from college, I, would, I wouldn't have been ready, and I would not have lasted as long as I did last. So the right move was for me to st go into the minor leagues and kind of grind and learn, learn my profession and learn my craft uh, and, and, you know, have a better appreciation, not just on the field, but off the field for the dirty work that you need to do and the riding the buses and, and all the stuff that comes with it. Okay, so you're so you've you're now in the MLS. I think you played in the MLS thirteen years, fourteen years. Um, yeah, I think it was yeah, fourteen, fifteen full time, and then three, three or four years of kind of the up and back stuff. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, and then during that thirteen, fourteen years, you've you're you've now you know you've had one knee surgery, major knee surgery. You yep. have, you have you have two more during that yep. time. Um that you have to battle through mm -hmm. um, uh, while the while, all the while holding a place at, at uh, well, you played for Columbus, you played for uh, San Jose, Chicago, and then Chicago twice, right? Yeah. Yeah. I went back to yeah. Chicago that last year. Yeah. You know, and, and um, so then you go to, you, 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 uh, you finish it, it, it's, a, you finish at Chicago, you sign with Indianapolis for two years, mm -hmm. sort of as a sort of as a player goalkeeper coach. Yeah, you know, and now you've begun your transition into goalkeeper coaching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, share with the kids, you know, sort of the I don't know. First of all, your coaching philosophies, but sort of the transition that you make from being, you know, the sorry old pro to you know uh older pro know, older pro <laughs> the, the the sage veteran to uh, <laughs> to, to grandpa uh, yeah, to uh you know to 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 play a couple of years in uh, indianapolis and then now uh ramping yourself up to be a full-time goalkeeper coach yeah. along with your glove company and, and all that yeah so, you know, I went back to Chicago for that last year and it, it didn't go well. The team was in shambles, the locker room, everything. Um, so after that season, there was, a, there was a little bit of interest still in the MLS. Um, I think it was Philly and Toronto were the two teams, if I remember correctly. Um, but a little bit out of the blue, I, I get a call from Indiana, uh, Indianapolis and uh, they were in the NASL at the time that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But um one of the players brad ring who i played with in san jose who's from indiana went back there and so i knew a little bit about it um good atmosphere they get good crowds that sort of thing uh they reached out to me and offered a unique situation um i could still play i could still be the number one i, I would be an, a second assistant coach and basically my role would be um video analysis, uh, you know, sitting in meetings, but more importantly, training the goalkeepers. Uh, you know, so it was a start to kind of the next cycle and the, and the next thing in my book. Um, so I jumped, you know, after talking a little to Nikki about it, I decided to jump on it um, and give myself an opportunity and, and start to understand what the other side of the coin looks like in the coaching world. Uh, so we spent two years here, um, it was good for me because not only do I, did I have to still make sure I was prepared because I was still playing, but also now I'm in charge of two young goalkeepers and trying to develop them and figure them out. And, you know, we had two totally different uh, backups. We had a young kid from Jersey, Keith, who was six, I think six, five. And then we had an, a young kid, Christian, who came out of IU who was about my size. Actually, I think he was a little bit smaller than me. So two, two totally different styles. Um, and it was very educational for me uh, as a coach, um, you know, because again, I knew what I needed to train and be prepared for a Saturday night, but I also needed to prepare these two 
in case either I wasn't going to play or I was injured or whatever. Um, so that was a little bit of a balancing act uh, the first half of my first year here uh, because sometimes I had to just have the, the, the players hat on. And then there was other times I was a little bit of the liaison, if you want to call it, in between the two main coaches and the players. You know, so sometimes yeah. there were there were little fires that I might have to deal with that the head coach doesn't need to know about because they're not important enough. Um, you know, so I did a lot of that kind of work, the in-between work. Um, and that, again, that was very, very good for me to learn that kind of stuff and, and what what needs to go to the head coach and what maybe doesn't need to go to the head coach because he's got bigger fish to fry, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was fun. Like I said, it, it took me a while to understand it because it was a unique situation. Um, because like I said, on a Saturday night, you know, I'm lining up with all these guys and we have to be on the same page, but sometimes, you know, uh, during the week, I might have to, I might have to discuss something with, you know, the captain or some of the other players or, you know, pull them aside and be a little bit more coach ish. If, if that makes sense on them. Right. right. Um, so, so we got, so we got, uh, coach Lou, we're, we're, closing in on time here shall we do the powerpoint or shall we go straight to questions what do you think i think we uh i think we go to questions um yeah you know, i'm good with that um, yeah i think you know i think your philosophy is important but i think we'll get more out of questions from the group um all right there so you know, guys, as as we have in the past, go ahead and type the questions, and I will uh, I will share them with uh, with Bushy here, and he'll answer. And I will combine any that are very similar. Um, so I already have one. It's from uh, Stephanie Louder. Uh, it's how long did it take you to master your right foot? <laughs> uh well, let's see. Um, to be able to kick it down the field, it probably took uh, two to three years um, to get to a point where I really felt comfortable with it. Um, probably a little bit longer. Um, you know, I don't exactly know. But I, I mean, I got to a point probably in my early years as a pro where I felt comfortable being able to take a back pass if it came from my right and go to my left. And then if I got it from my left, go to my right with it where, you know, in my early days, even after I knew I could kick it with my right, I was still nervous taking it onto my right. So that was kind of the next part of the process, right? It's one thing to be able to strike the ball down the field with no pressure. There's another part of it where now you get comfortable enough when somebody's running a forward sprinting at you to be able to say, no problem. I can cut it onto my right. And I can play the ball that I need, whether it's a short pass or a longer ball. So it, it took a few years, I would say. Would you? Could you argue you're still trying to master your right foot? You're always trying to get better. Yeah, exactly. Right? You're you're always trying. To, I'm I'm never satisfied. Yeah. You know, there's always things you can learn, even even yeah. when you're old and retired, like myself. Yeah. Well, that's not 100 percent true because my left foot is for buying pants. <laughs> So <laughs> I, never, I never even tried to, I never even tried to, the mastery of it. I didn't even get the first grade on that one. So you didn't, you didn't need it back then though. You just, that's true. The that's true. The yeah. That's right. That's right. Those are the days. <laughs> Put it right, down, we got another Put it one. Down. Yeah. We got a couple more. This okay. is good. Uh, this is, this is the first, this is a good one. Similar to someone asked to Stefan, what's your favorite healthy snack, John? I have a few unhealthy favorite snacks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> children, children. <laughs> yes, don't listen to this. I, we didn't have nutritionists when I started. So uh, um, healthy snack. Um, I mean, I, I honestly, I eat a lot of fruit. I, I like fruit. I like a lot of grapefruits and things like that. Uh, but probably healthy snack. Um, I like trail mix. Do a lot of trimmings, a lot of nuts and, and some raisins and that sort of thing. Occasionally throw some M&Ms in there to give me a little chocolate. But uh, I would say that. Nice. I want some trail mix now. Um, <laughs> so this is a good question. Uh, I'm going to get through all of them, guys. Don't worry. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions here, John. Okay. Uh, one is, 
It's combined from Jordan and Ethan. Uh, okay. Jordan's question is, how long did it take you to realize you wanted to go pro? And then um, this is a good part of that. So you've decided you want to be a pro. Was there ever any doubt that you wouldn't make it mm. because you were smaller? And that part good of question. comes from Ethan. Okay. Um, so I... Again, the first time I, I remember thinking about possibly even thinking about being a pro was, you know, probably 15, 16, like I said, we, with the youth national teams being in Europe. You know, when you're in Europe, you saw it all the time. We were, we were always training at their facilities, so they were around. We didn't, we didn't really understand it, but we saw them, and we understood that they were pros and they were getting paid. So that's kind of when it started. Um, to really understand it, I think was when I was at Charlotte and started to see the guys coming in to train. Then, then it was something I think that was probably a bit more tangible at that point where I said, okay, you know, this, this is where I really want to go. I, I can now see it. Um, so that, that's probably when it started. Uh, was, was there any, ever any doubt? Um, I'd like to say, no, I'm sure there probably was. I think I was just so determined that I never listened to the doubters, you know, and, and one of the things I've, I've always done in my career and it started very, very early um, when I was 15, 16 was when I would hear that people would say he's, he's not big enough. He's not tall enough. Um, I would turn that negativity around into a positive and use it as motivation. Uh, for me, I, I remember the, you know, every time I, I, what I would do is I would, you know, I had a mental checklist and, Perfect example, John Kowalski was the under-20 national team coach. And even though Peter Miller desperately wanted me to make that jump, John, you know, John was the first person I really remember saying, he's too small, he's too small, he's too small. So any time I made the jump to the next level from high school to college, college to pros, right, and I had those mental pictures in my head and their names in my head, it was just like crossing it off on a piece of paper, right? And it gave me, self, it gave me satisfaction because I proved them all wrong. Um, you know, I never bought into it. You know, I used it, I used it to stoke my fire, if you will. Um, so yeah, there was, I'm sure there was days where I doubted it, you know, and, and, you know, whether it was taking so long, you know, in the minor leagues, uh, again, cause when you're young, you're impatient and you don't know any better. Um, you know, I'm sure there were days when I got cut or got traded or got released where I questioned it, you know, but I just think it was, it was, who I was supposed to be and I was so determined to get there and I didn't I didn't have a plan b per se I really didn't it was you know plan a or I was going to die trying um you know so I think that that's honestly what it was I was just going to keep beating down the door and kicking the door until somebody let me in hopefully I think that's uh important you know I think um someone's always going to have their opinion but yeah. And the matters is, is, is yours. And how are you going to use yep. that to get where you want to go? You, um, you know, the other part is you're not ever, you're not always going to be everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. Right. And I think players need to understand that you're not, everybody's going to love you. We want them to love you and think you're the best goalkeeper out there, but not everybody, you're not, you don't fit into everybody's you know team and it's not right or wrong. You just gotta, you just gotta find the right, the, the person that's going to take that chance on you. For sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm shorter as well, so I, I know the struggle. So, uh, you know, I think you have an inch or two on me. So, you know, and that's that's good. So, I mean, um, I think on that on that vein, I think this is a, this is an anonymous question. They they are allowed to do that. Um, okay. Uh, so I don't know who asked this question. Uh, other than are keeper stats important? If so, what statistics are college coaches looking at? in the recruiting process. I have my opinion. I know Evie has his, so let's, we can get down to, to yours on that. Me, I don't really look at stats. I look at videos and, you know, or the, the eye test, if you want to call it that. You know, yeah, stat, stats are good at the end of your career to look back on and say, I did this or I did that or look at these numbers. But for me, I'm more of can they play, period. You know, because you might be on – you know, you might be on a team where you give up, you know, 50 shots a game and your goalie gives up three goals, but you know what? He stood on his head or she stood on his head or her head, you know, for the whole game. And that's going to develop them better anyway. Um, 
you know, so it might be a lopsided situation like that. So for me, it's more about the eye test and, and what they bring to training as well as, as to games. So for me, I wouldn't get caught, caught up into the, the stats really, you know, unless you got bonus money or something on, on stats. But uh, if you don't, then don't worry about them. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I, I remember this clear as day uh, because um, when I guess Frank had called you, you mm-hmm. know, and said, you know, and you had decided to come to the to Charlotte to visit, you know, Frank, Frank, I, we had, I either had lunch or something. He said, Oh, yeah, by the way, I said, uh, he says, uh, I've recruited a goalkeeper, we got a goalkeeper coming, you know, and I was like, great, you know, and, and his next words were, well, he's, he's only five nine, you know, and I remember saying, it, will he work? Will he work hard? You know, and Frank said, yeah, I said, well, that's all it takes, really, you know, uh, so the, the, you know, as John says, the stat stuff is important, but to be honest with you guys, you know, what's going to happen in the recruiting process is the, the school's goalkeeper coach is going to call coach Lou or call me and we're going to talk goalkeeping about you. Yeah. Right. And then that's really, that's kind of how the decisions are made. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the head coach, and you guys can jump in here and, and uh, with your two cents, but the head coaches or the assistants are going to see you in one of the tournaments you're one of the showcase tournaments you're at. But then they're, if you're a goalkeeper, they're going to turn it over to the goalkeeper coaches yeah. and you guys talk goalie and yeah. sort it out. I Agreed. can say from when I was a recruiting coordinator, not once did I look at stats uh, for a goalkeeper. Um, I I wanted to go watch him train. I wanted to go watch him play a match. I wanted to get as much video on him as I could. Uh, I wanted to see him get scored on, what they do after. I mean, I mean, John, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, stats are great for when you're retired and, I, you know, but when you're trying to get recruited, it's can you play? You know, I'm yep. a firm believer in that as well. So, um, right. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, you know, what is – Finn asks, what is your favorite – what is your view on playing sports in the off season and what's your favorite sport outside of soccer? I know you already that's, a, on it a that's an easy one, Finn. That's an easy one. Yes. I agree. You should play other sports. Okay. Especially when you're younger um, because they just teach you athleticism that sometimes soccer doesn't teach you, you know, different movements, whether it's basketball, whether it's, you know, football, baseball, whatever. Uh, for me, Finn, hands down, it was hockey. Again, growing up in upstate New York, you learned how to skate pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I still to this day, when I can and I got time, I go play old man hockey. Um, I've played a few pond hockey tournaments with EV, and we've had a blast. Um, you know, but it's it's just, yeah, that that's – if I was better at it, Finn, I would have played hockey, but I'm, I wasn't that good. So uh, – but that's my escape from the world sometimes. I just go play pickup hockey when I can. Um, so, yes, play as many sports as you can until you get to a certain point where you realize, okay, it's time to really, really hundred percent focus on nothing but soccer. Love that answer. 100% agree. 100% agree. I know Evie does too. So yeah. yeah. Finn, if you ever get a chance to go skate on a pond, buddy, yeah, it's heaven on earth. Yes, it is. It truly is. Um, all right. Uh, Kylie, uh, who is one of our seniors, uh, who will be going off to, to college in the fall. Uh, Asks a great question here. Uh, Has there been a time when you were chasing the number one spot behind a keeper that was already established on a team? If so, how did you approach competing for the spot? Who was that from? From I'm from Kylie. 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 Every team I went to in the MLS had an established goalkeeper. Okay, I'm going to tell you two stories, and I'm going to let E.B. fill it in at the end in San Jose and what he said to somebody. I don't remember who he said it to, but I'll, I'll let him fill it in. So when I, went to, when I went to Columbus, all right, minor leagues up to the major leagues, uh, they had a goalkeeper named Tom Prestis, very good goalkeeper, 6'4", I think he was. Uh, the year before, maybe two years before, he was playing for D.C. United when they won one of the championships. Um, so when I got there, you know, straight as could be, Greg told me, you're the number two, uh, you battle for it. No problem. I did that by halfway through. I was a starter in my first year. Uh, went to, uh, sorry, went to Chicago with, uh, by the end of my first year, I was a starter there. 
they had Matt Pickens, who they had been grooming and decided that he was going to be their heir apparent uh, that year. So uh, that first year I got there, it was about – that was when I was just coming off my double ACL as well. So it was more about me starting to really get back and, and try to stay healthy. Uh, but by the end of that year, uh, Matt had left, and uh, I became the starter the following year. Uh, and that was when I became goalkeeper of the year. Uh, when I got traded to San Jose, which was probably the biggest shocker, um, they had a gentleman named Joe Cannon, who was at least one time, maybe two time goalkeeper of the year uh, from San Jose, California, did everything for the earthquakes at that time, uh, pretty much the face of San Jose earthquakes. Um, and by halfway through the season, uh, I was number one. And if I remember correctly, I don't remember who you told. I think maybe Dave or somebody. Okay. And I'll, let you, I'll let you take it from here. I'll let <laughs> you take the story from here. I, I remember when Bushy got traded, a, a guy that we coach with all the time. Um, and he, he, Coach Dave's a great guy, but he doesn't have much to do. So he calls me up and uh, he's, he's ranting and raving because Bush got a raw deal here. He's going to San Jose and, you know, he's just – Coach Dave's going off as only Coach Dave can. <laughs> and uh, – and, you know, and I said, Dave, relax. I said, he'll, he'll go there. He'll bust his butt. And within about six weeks, he'll be the starter because that's what he does. He goes and he outworks everybody who's there. And, and he makes it so they have to play him. And then he'll hold down the position. You know, and that's, that's ultimately what happened. That's what, that's what has happened throughout basically your career. Yeah. Yeah. About halfway through, I took over the starting position from Joe Cannon. And the following year, they sent him to Vancouver. Yeah. And so there you go. Yeah. I have to remember when that happened. Um, Joe actually was one of the guys I used to watch along with you. And I remember when that happened, it was a really big deal. They, yeah. you know, ESPN made a big, big deal about it. So, yeah, I, I was actually shocked when the, my agent called me, we were, we were, my wife and I were actually going to drive. We were in Chicago. We were driving to Columbus for the weekend just because we didn't have anything to do because I, I had put, been put on re, uh, waivers by Chicago. Um, so we we're going to spend the weekend with our friends. And my agent called on Friday when we were driving out of town. He's like, hey, the GM of San Jose is going to call you in five minutes. I just want to make sure you know that, you know, they want you to come out there. And I remember saying to him, like, why? They have Joe Cannon. I literally said that. Like, why do they want me? Um, so that's really how it started. So. Uh, that's that's the pro game um, exactly exactly the pro game you know, um, and and you know one thing guys you know we talk about the pro game and, and bushy hit the nail on the head when he said you know you think you think getting to the mls is you know david beckham it's the david beckham show and everything's great and everything you know uh i remember when we used to have kids come to the camps you know the first thing i told these guys to do was every day they had to read the transactions in the newspaper of all sports because you know we all hear about the Peyton Mannings and the David Beckhams and the you know all these stars but the guys you know the guys who are the the journeymen of the sport are really what makes us the you know we used to call them the plumbers when I was playing the plumbers are what makes the sport go and those guys get traded they get moved around <laughs> you know and uh, if you can if you can accept that and realize that it's just part of the occupation you'll you'll be fine you know but if you can't and it'll, and there's a lot of people that can't particularly goalkeepers because like Adelaide said when we had her on a couple of weeks ago you know there's only one goalkeeper so you're fighting for one spot you know and and as John said you're not going to always be everybody's cup of tea so what do you do you get up there you put your head down and you work and you and you you work until they can't ignore you anymore yep absolutely um yeah. So uh, Blake would like to know: Is there a certain uh, goalkeeper that you like to watch? Um, there's been a few. Uh, there's been many, but there's been a few, and it's changed. You know, again, in the early days, uh, like many, because we were very limited to our, uh, you know, internet and all that kind of stuff. It was you know Tony Miola and Casey Keller. Um, you know, started with Tony because he was from Jersey and I was from New York. Even though he was older than me, he used to come to our regional camps when I was a kid. So I first, you know, met Tony through that. Um, and then it became Casey, you know, through the youth national teams and all that stuff. 
again, a little bit older than I was, but, uh, you know, he became the next one. And then when I started really watching games, uh, it became a gentleman named Shea Given, who at that time played for Newcastle United, was an you know, absolute legend for them. Uh, you know, played again, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 years, probably something like that. Uh, again, the reason I watched him was because he was short. And that was one of the guys Peter Miller used to tell me all the time to watch. He's like, you're going to play like him, so you need to watch him. Um, so, yeah, he was one of the ones. Uh, I watched Vandasar. I really I love Vandasar, even though, you know, he's much taller than I was. But the thing I took from him was he could distribute with both feet, not just off the ground, but even drop kicks. Uh, he was amazing to watch. And he, he made everything look so easy. You know, he, he was never, like, floundering around or flapping around like sometimes you see. You know, this guy made even the most difficult thing look easy. Um, so, for me, those were the guys. Um, in today's game, you know, it's, it's changed a little. I like Ben Foster a lot. Um, obviously, I watch Ederson. I watch Allison. Um, you know, guys like that. But, uh, you know, th those were the guys I looked for when I played. Well, I could see you liking Ben because, you know, he was a cook before he was a Premier League goalkeeper. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We have food in common. I <laughs> found on the Sunday League field, you know, worked his way up. So, <laughs> no lags to riches, right? So, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, those are all fantastic examples. And for those of you that are, um, you know, still on here or going to watch back, I think you should go YouTube up every single name that was just put out there because they're fantastic examples of, of goalkeepers. Um, you know, um, so, uh, there's a couple questions here that, that kind of go hand in hand. Okay. Um, there, you know, I'm going to answer this one. Uh, <laughs> someone asks is, were you the competitive type? And the answer is yes, 100%. You <laughs> 21 year pro if you're not competitive. Um, and I, I think I just remember you telling the story about waking up, um, you know, two o'clock in the morning because you were wanting to watch game film. You know, if that doesn't say you're competitive, I don't really know what does. Um, and then this other one is um, the last one here. Last couple is, were you afraid to fail? And what did you do so you didn't fail? Um. Yeah, you're always afraid to fail. But if that actually stops you, you know, then you're failing, right? I'd, I'd rather try and know that I, I gave everything I had and it just didn't work out than never actually try, right? If, if, if you're too scared to try because you want to fail, you're never going to succeed. And so – Again, like I talked about having a mental checklist in my head about people, I, I also use the fear of failure to motivate myself. Because again, being a smaller guy, I knew I didn't have a long leash like some of these bigger goalies. So I knew I had to be as close to perfect in everything I did. And, and I think that's why I was so obsessed with the craft of being a goalkeeper, because I knew I didn't have a long leash. Um, you know, so that fear of failure was more, again, more just motivation, um, you know, because, and I can say this now, and I, and I think I said this to EV, you know, when it was all said and done, when we, you know, when I retired and he was there with me, it was, it, it's, and I didn't know it as a player, but it is an amazing feeling, even though it was, it was sad and I didn't want to do it, but it was time to go. But there's no better feeling when you walk out the door knowing that you have put everything you have into something. It doesn't matter the amount of time, right? It didn't matter it was 21 years. Yes, I mean, it was amazing 21 years. But the fact of the matter was, for whatever the duration of the time was, I put everything physically, mentally, emotionally into being the best I could. And I think when you do that, when it is time to go, you will walk out the door and you will go, okay, yes, I'm sad because it's over, but I also understand like I have nothing left in my tank and I'm okay with that. And it gives you a little bit of sense of peace, if you will. 
pretty deep for a goal. Yeah, huh? very, very good. good. No, true. <laughs> true. Really, really nothing more to say than that. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll and and you'll kids, you'll find that in life, you know, whatever you choose to do, you know, you you if you're if you if you're going to do it, you might as well go whole hog. You might as well go after yeah. it. And uh, um, you know, and and John's a perfect testament to that because you know he he worked. Let me tell you, he worked and. Um, at the end of the 21 years, it was time and no regrets. And that's yeah. what you want. That's what you want after playing. That's what you want after life, you know? Um, so, so I guess it's getting time to wrap up here. Uh, um, so oh, we got more, we got more. more. Uh, I, uh, these are the last three. So if, yeah, uh, keep going. These are injury time. We're in injury time. <laughs> injury time here. You know, I think this is a good one. These are good questions tonight. I don't want to leave. Yeah, great. Either. Great. Um, Get them all answered, Lou. No problem. So uh, Chase uh, and and Harrison kind of in the same vein here. So Chase asks, when you would practice your weak foot, would you just look for repetition or would you focus on technique? Um, and then Harrison asks, are there any specific drills or workouts you perform to compensate for less height? You kind of touched on both of those earlier, so you can kind of go a little deeper. Uh, as an FYI, Harrison is is uh, is a shorter male goalkeeper so that okay all right um, from that vein got you so to start again when i start with my right foot it was more just to find the technique and figure out what it felt like because when you start with your non-dominant foot it feels weird and you know your your approach to the ball everything is not as fluid and as comfortable as it is with your dominant foot. so for me it was really breaking it down and just figuring out how it felt approaching the ball, how it felt to strike it. I wasn't worried about distance or accuracy or any of that stuff. Um, it was just finding a routine and finding a rhythm. Um, the rest of it will come. The accuracy, the distance, all that as you get more comfortable with it. So that that's how it started. It was just figuring it out and finding the technique. Um, as far as the jumping, uh, it was, you know, again, heavy plyos for me. Um, I also started picking up the jump rope very early. Um, and originally, before I got a weight vest, originally I would put ankle weights around my ankles uh, and I would jump with those. And eventually when I figured that out that they actually made weight vests, um, I, and I actually still do it to this day, um, I have a, a weight vest that I put on and I jump rope with it. Um, and I did that probably... I think I started really picking it up maybe shortly after uh, I got to Columbus, if I remember correctly. Um, and I did it my, the rest of my career. Uh, it was actually funny because uh, in a Zoom call just the other day with Phil Wedden, Phil Wedden was uh, the goalkeeper coach when I was with the full national team with Bruce Arena and then Bob Bradley. Uh, I, used to, I used to travel with my jump rope. And so there would be days where we'd have a morning – field session and then we'd be in the gym afternoon or vice versa and when I would finish with the team uh, in the gym I'd whip out my jump rope and I would stay there for anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes just jump roping and some days sometimes I did travel with my weight vest it just depended on how long camps were and things and I remember Phil kind of coming over to me and standing beside me at one point and kind of looking at me and going what are you doing I'm like I, I always jump rope three days a week and he goes, well, how long do you go for? I said, depends on how I feel, but anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. And he just shook his head and walked away. <laughs> uh, but I just tra I tra I travel with my jump rope. You know, it sounds weird. But, uh, again, that was something I knew would help me, not just for height, you know, and, and, and explosiveness, but also uh, foot quickness. Yeah. So. I, I can just picture big old Phil Wed and – Yeah, yeah. He did. He didn't understand the short man problems. He didn't Big understand Phil. short man problems because <laughs> I think Phil's like Phil's like EV size guys. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, he is. Well, he's another great, great mind in goalkeeping. But yeah, I could just picture him tilting his head and just shaking it and walking away. Um, yeah, it's exactly what he did. It's kind of funny. Awesome. All right. Well, one more here. We'll, we'll wrap yep. it up on another. You know, another good one. I think to end the night. Um, Kate asks, how did you prepare for the mental side of playing in college and playing pro? Great question. Great question. 
Um, I think going into college, um, I did not understand the mental side that well, to be quite honest with you. I, again, I'm, I was, I'm a New Yorker. Sometimes I get a little hot headed. Um, you know, it's gotten better over the years, but it's still there. But I think, uh, especially in today's game and with the uh, people you have around you to help you, like sports psychologists, I was very fortunate that when I got to Columbus, we had a sports psychologist on staff. And he was at two to three days a week of training. Some days he just watched. Some days you could just chat with him. Other days he'd do things with the teams, you know, different drills and stuff, uh, you know, mental stuff. And that's when I really started understanding the power of the mental side of being a goalkeeper, um, the positives and the negatives. Because that's also when, you know, for the first time, most of my games are starting to be recorded or on TV. And now you're dealing with that whole uh, part of it as well. And uh, so I spent a lot of time with Dr. Ty Case in, in Columbus in the early days, you know, and, and he taught me different things to do. Uh, he taught me about visualization and seeing myself do it, you know, and, and shortly after getting to Columbus, I started routines where I was visualized before practice. And I would visualize when I got to the game, uh, when I got the games and EB knows this, um, if the team had to be in at, let's say the team had to be in at 6.30 uh, into the locker room, I was always, I was always 30 minutes, at least 30 to 45 minutes before any other player walked in. And what I would do is I'd get in, I'd change right away into, into some shorts and a t-shirt, i put my headphones on, i get my ankle taped, and then I would go sit in my locker for 10 to 15 minutes. And i just close my eyes and I would visualize myself you making every kind of save, scoops, overhands, diving, catching crosses, distributing the ball, everything I was going to do that night, I would see myself do it in my head. And when I was done 10 to 15 minutes of that, um, I would go into either a spare room or a lot of time I just used the shower area if that was all we had. And I did a lot of uh, racquetball reaction work. Um, just again, getting myself in tune, getting myself thinking catching and doing all this stuff and just kind of warming myself up before uh, I would actually go out for a warm up. So that was just my way to kind of get my mind in tune to what I needed to do that night and to push everything else in the outside world away for the next two hours. Um, and, and again, using a sports psychologist really helped, you know, uh, especially again, during injuries that that's a time where it becomes very mental. You know, anybody can handle the physical side of an injury, right? The rehab, the riding the bikes, the lifting the weights. It's those lonely hours where you might just be by yourself or you might be just with a trainer that those are the ones that can get you as an athlete, right? Because there's a lot of questions flying around in your head. So you have to be, uh, you have to be open to knowing how to deal with those, you know, and, and knowing how to take each day as it can as, as a building block and a wall and not see the big picture because that can be very intimidating. No, I think routines are, are good and, um, you know, but I think the, the piece that I like the most about that is your routine was, was uh, it was fluid. It wasn't, you didn't have to do something for X amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. It was, and it didn't have to be a spare room. It could be the shower. It could, you know, and I yeah. think that's, I would argue um, that's probably why it was so successful for you because it wasn't so rigid, um, you know, and we see all the time, well, I have to do this. I have to do that. Well, sometimes you don't, you can't. So how yeah. do you make sure you still accomplish what you need? Yeah. Um, you know, a little flexibility, uh, but a way to ground yourself. I mean, I think that's for me, I think that's a fantastic way to, to end the night. Um, yeah. You know, um, again, Bush, Bushy, we can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. Um, I know that we had a we had a great uh, great group. I think we had a upwards of fifty plus tonight. Uh, oh, fantastic! And, you know, I think that's great. I mean, we're we're crushing our average with with these, so that's awesome. And then um, you know, keeping it up around forty five fifty each each night. So again, thank you for coming on and. We'll get this up for those that couldn't make it. So uh, I'll yeah. leave you to, to wrap us up. Well, Bushy, as always, thank you for visiting with us. And, and um, if it's okay with you, we will use the PowerPoint uh, 
with our next webinar, which is next Thursday, yep. uh, the in, in possession PowerPoint will be a good sort of starting block for Coach Lou and myself to go over with the kids. But uh, you know, as always, it's it's a pleasure to visit with you. It's great. It's it's great to have the kids hear from a real pro and what's everything that's involved. And uh, we 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 greatly appreciate you taking the time to visit with us. No, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, if we didn't get any questions, you know, the kids can come visit me on Twitter and Instagram and uh, I'm always here for them to, to help them out any way I can. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Uh, Bushy. We'll, we'll make sure we get the, uh, at HPG, uh, HPG, GK. Yeah. We'll get that, we'll get that tagged up. <laughs> get that up there on this video as well. And, uh, we'll, uh, make sure we get this out there uh, tomorrow or Saturday morning when it gets up. So awesome. Great. Awesome. Great. Again. All right, gentlemen, enjoy Thanks, your Bushy. evening. Thanks coach. Thanks, Lou. Appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks guys. All right. Enjoy it. See ya. See ya.